Um, hello, uh, welcome to everyone. Welcome to this uh, webinar. So today we are going uh, to talk about uh, the transformation of our, our food system uh, and uh, curtain meat, uh, talk about the latest development and the future uh, perspectives. Uh, so this webinar is taking place um, because the new food conference has been cancelled uh, because of the pandemic, uh, but the next uh, new food conference, the physical event, is going to take place uh, next year in Berlin in April uh, 28 and 29 of April. So the new food conference is organized by Provege. It's a unique industry-oriented uh, event uh, with uh, two topics, so plant-based product and cereal agriculture. Um, so it's an industry-oriented event uh, that aims to accelerate and empower innovative uh, food technology by bringing, uh, bringing together uh, key stakeholders. It's uh, the Europe's uh, biggest conference on alternative protein solutions, and the people who attend the conference uh, can meet leading experts, uh, can have access to valuable networks, and uh, try products uh, on site. Um, so Provege is uh, working on this topic of cereal agriculture, so working on different things, communication, consumer acceptance, so organizing events, uh, informing the consumers, advising the, the, the food industry, so many things. Um, and so today we are going to talk about uh, culture meat with our uh, uh, three guests. Uh, so just briefly, so culture meat is uh, well, producing meat, but from uh, animal cells. So we take some cells from uh, an animal with a painless uh, biopsy. Uh, we put these cells in a machine, um, uh, an incubator with the nutrients and uh, the cells uh, develop, multiply, and we have uh, meat. And this meat is developed to be better for the environment, better for the animals and better for uh, the humans, uh, better in terms of um, uh, public health, uh, like uh, we uh, this cu uh, current crisis really show the importance of uh, by developing uh, alternatives to uh, conventional uh, industrial animal farming. Uh, so uh, our three guests. Uh, so the first one, uh, Helen Miller from uh, uh, Alefarm. So she is head of uh, the European Affairs at Alefarm. So it's a company in its way producing, uh, uh, working on the development of cultured meat. And uh, she, Ellen is going to uh, talk about uh, like uh, how to build a resi uh, resilient food system in the light of the farm to fork strategy and the role of uh, culture meat in this food system. Then uh, we have uh, uh, David Brandes, uh, who is managing director of, at uh, Piece of Meat, uh, another uh, culture meat company in, in Belgium. Uh, David is going to talk about uh, hybrid products, so plant-based and cell based products. products. And that would be also great to have a few words on, of, uh, on the, uh, the, the support uh, piece of meat uh, get from the Flemish um, government. And then to so Mark Post, uh, who is a CSO of uh, Mozemit, also a professor at the Maastricht University, uh, who is go uh, going to talk about uh, the, so the, the science uh, from uh, R&D to the, the scale up of the production and different uh, challenges, uh, such as the regulatory approval. Alors, just uh, before the first presentation, uh, I would like to uh, tell uh, the attendees that you can uh, ask questions in the Q&A box uh, that you can see uh, here. Uh, and we'll have um, like uh, 15 minutes uh, after the presentation to answer the, your questions. Uh, so, uh, yeah, please, Elena, we can uh, start with uh, the first presentation. Hi. Yeah, so I'll share my screen. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to, to, to talk now. So I'm Helen Miller. I'm head of European Affairs at Aleph Farms. Um, I was previous, previously a French and Israeli lawyer specializing in regulation. Uh, so at Aleph Farms, we cultivate high-quality beef steak directly from cells we isolate from a healthy core. Aleph Farms was co-founded in 2017 by Didier Toubia, CEO, the Israeli food tech incubator, the kitchen of the Strauss Group, a global food company, and the Technion, a research institution in Israel. The company has been based 
has been started based on the transfer of the technology developed by Professor Shulamit Levenberg at the Technion. Professor Levenberg is a worldwide expert in the field of tissue engineering. So Aleph Farms technology relies on the natural process of regeneration occurring inside the animal, same as inside our own bodies. So as Nathalie said, we start by taking a cell sample from a healthy cow and then nurturing those cells in the most optimal, safe environment, rich of amino acids, vitamins, minerals, in order to form muscle tissue, which is meat under controlled conditions. So the thin cut steaks are non-GMO and free from antibiotics or contaminations. So this way we will enable the consumer to have real meat, taste, texture, and flavor of the steak we know with no compromise on quality. So the quality is segmented into three pillars, sensory, culinary, and nutritional. Um, Alefarm has been recently uh, recognized as a technology pioneer by the World Economic Forum. Aleph's innovation has been selected by NetExplo Forum in partnership with the UNESCO as one of the 10 most promising innovation of the year and is a EIT food rising star company. So to enter more concretely the subject, first of all, I will present a very quick state of the situation regarding meat production in Europe and why a transition toward a sustainable food system is needed. Then I will pre briefly present Europe's ambitious answer to this challenge. And finally, I'll present Aleph Farm's vision regarding the essential role that cultured meat could play in this transition to the agriculture of tomorrow. So uh, on this, I will be quick because I think we are aware of the, of, of, of the situation. So regarding the environmental impact of agriculture, the current way of producing meat is not sustainable as it requires a huge amount of land and water and contributes significantly to global warming, warming through greenhouse gas emissions. In terms of human health, the overuse of antibiotics for farmed animals contributes to the development of superbugs that are resistant to key medicines. And finally, concerning animal welfare, as you know, approximately 56 billion animals are slaughtered every year, not including fish, a large part of those in intensive factory farming facilities. There are also problematics that were recently highlighted by the COVID-19 crisis. COVID-19 hotspot erupted at several slaughterhouses across Germ Germany. Uh, according to the German Labor Minister, it's not, this not only endangered the employees, but also the public. And in the US, Tyson Foods, one of America's biggest meat producers, warned that the food supply chain is breaking. So, as you see, uh, exist, existing, existing food production don't have the capability of feeding the growing global population, given the availability or the lack of availability of natural resources, uh, land and water. And um, in order to feed the world population today and tomorrow, we need to find alternative solution, to find and develop alternative solution in order to supplement the current ways of producing food and meat in particular. So Europe's answer. Uh, the green transition has started in Europe. The EU aims to be climate neutral by 2050. This objective is at the heart of the European Green Deal. In order to comply with this objective, Aleph Farms pledged to eliminate emissions associated with, the, with its meat production by 2025 and reach the same net zero emission across its entire supply chain by 2030. The farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy are at the heart of the European Green Deal, aiming to make food system fair, healthy, and environmentally friendly, and restore degraded ecosystem across the EU. Uh, so the farm to fork strategy proposes a set of measures in order to reach this goal, including reducing the use of pesticides, reducing nutrient losses, reducing fertilizer, reducing the sale of, for antimicrobials, and achieving 25% of total farmland 
under organic farming by 2030. So in other words, Europe aims to revert to a more grass-fed, organic, regenerative agriculture. It means improving the quality, even if it, uh, it means even if it, it, it leads to a reduction of the quantities. But um, if we reduce the quantity and the demand continues to increase, then there will be a gap, and this gap needs to be filled. Therefore, we believe that it will not be possible to reach carbon neutrality in Europe without incorporating new technologies and new production processes within agriculture. That's where cultivated meat is becoming a necessary piece of European strategy. It really becomes a cornerstone of the plan Europe is implementing. So Alefarm vision for the meat industry by 2040 is to move forward two categories of meat products. On the one hand, meat produced by conventional farming methods in line with the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy. And on the other hand, cultured meat, which would provide healthy and quality meat in addition to animal production from slaughter. So like red wine and white wine, we envision two categories of meat products, conventional meat and cultured meat, two different value propositions coexisting in the same market. So it's not a question of replace, it's not a question of replacing conventional agriculture, but of supplementing it by a sustainable way of producing meat. So cultivated meat at a large scale will be produced in bio farms. So this picture is not an uh, actual bio farm because um, uh, it, it doesn't, it's not built yet, but uh, it's to give you an idea about how it will look like. So it will be very similar to a yogurt production plant. Uh, the idea of Ale Farm is to develop a global platform for local production because Post COVID 19, we believe that globalization will have to find the right balance between a global economy and a local production. So, these biofarms, uh, which can be implanted anywhere uh, where there is a need for meat, uh, will be totally automated, hygienic, and without any direct contact between humans and animals. This guarantees an aseptic process in an environment free of pathogens where no antibiotics are required. So Ale Farms prepares toward building its first pilot plants by 2022, beginning of 2023, in different geographies, um, uh, in order to establish and commercialize cultivated meat. Um, so the, the, the supply chain will be resilient, transparent, and traceable. Uh, there, are, there are short uh, production cycles offering great flexibility to respond instantly, instantly sorry, to a changing demand. So the, the, to produce a steak, a cultivated meat steak, takes three weeks compared to two years in uh, industrial farming. So in addition, uh, as you probably know, small farmers in Europe are, face are facing a crisis. The average age of farmer is close to 50 and half of today's livestock farmers will retire in 10 years with no young farmers or almost it will be difficult to replace them. So this means that there may not be enough farmers to produce enough meat, limiting agricultural competitiveness and food production in Europe. So Aleph, Biofarms local production approach will link with small farms and promote their prosperity by creating new business possibilities and supporting career change, changes. So incorporating new tools may help supporting farmers and give an incentive for the next generation to jump in. And to conclude, I would say that the most popular understanding of what sustainability is is based mostly on environmental aspects related to climate change, biodiversity and pollution. But at Ale Farms, we have developed a multi-layered strategy together with our sustainability advisory board and 
our Generation Z advisory board that encompasses environmental, social, nutritional, and economic pillars. We aim to develop not only a meat manufacturing company, but a key technology part of a sustainable food system that is responsible to deliver a better future for the generation to come. No, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Helen, for this presentation. Uh, now we are, so we're going to have uh, David Brandes um, from A Piece of Meat uh, presenting. Uh, David? Yep, coming up. Thank you, Nathalie, and great presentation, Helen. Thank you. Yeah, on the same panel like as Mark Post, it's a great honor to be here. I'm going to share my screen and uh, let me know if you see it full screen. Yes. Yep. Good. So today I would like to talk a little bit about uh, bridging plant-based meats and cell-based meats. So I think uh, um, Helen gave an excellent overview on the need for cultured meats, you know, the, the, the socio-ecological background. I'm sure we'll hear a lot of scientific background as well from Mark Post. I want to talk a little bit about the concrete applications in food at least when it comes to our vision of producing plant-based and cell-based products. Granted, this is not you know, uh, an industry perspective. I'm sure that um, Mark and Helen are pursuing a different pathway, but it's one that we believe uh, from Piece of Meat is quite um, promising. So bridging plant-based and cell-based meats, uh, a delight a sustainable carnivore craves for. Um, first of all, uh, on Piece of Meat, um, oh, little intro so so what we do uh, piece of meat is an anthro based uh, b2b supplier yeah we produce cultured fat that we're supplying into um, the plant-based meat industry um, this cultured fat is a tasty and texturing non-gmo fat yeah? and by adding 15 percent of that fat into an existing plant-based um, protein or a matrix of plant-based protein for example you know a, a pea soy a fungi uh, or other um, uh, protein matrices, we can replace 100% of the meatiness uh, of the product. Uh, we also are looking to solve all challenges to produce 100,000 tons of cultured fat. Yeah, so we are not only looking to um, produce a specialty product or a um, you know very highly uh, engineered, in, in this case, as we heard before, a three-dimensional product, but our, our objective is rather to produce a very high volume of biomass uh, over the next 10 years and that's what we've set out for. Um, so why do we do this? Um, first of all, to create a more sustainable food system. So it's really uh, for the planet and for the animals. I think that's a common denominator of everybody on the call here. Um, we also want to really improve the availability of yummy meats without the animal, right? So we want to not only um, attract, but also convert and retain a meat-eating customer um, in the, in the plant-based world. Uh, through full taste and texture. So what we're developing is a piece of meat cultured fat, and that's a delight sustainable foodies crave for, as mentioned before. Now, what do you want to eat, right? So when, uh, when waking up in the morning, we have to ask ourselves, uh, what do we want to eat? Where do we want to take our proteins in from? Uh, from what, what's our protein source, right? Um, I think uh, it's, it's very clear that there are great plant-based proteins out there. Um, I think insects is still something that, uh, that the industry uh, is, is partly talking of. There's obviously still the livestock animal that we can revert back to. And there might be novel, a bit more futuristic um, uh, products, which is what we're discussing today. So today I want to um, bring to you a bit more of a, of a perspective on how we believe the plant-based side and the cultured side uh, will be mixed in the future. Now let's, let's first of all take a step back and then look out into the future. Right? So here you see a matrix of meat-like look and meat-like taste. Right? And ideally, we want to get to the very top right where we have a product that looks like meat and tastes like meat. But obviously, ideally, uh, no animal had to, uh, had to be processed, uh, died and processed for. So in the year 2000, you've seen the first bean patties coming to the market. Um, those were dubbed plant-based meats, maybe. Um, but obviously, other than that, they were round and, uh, and you could fry them in a pan. They didn't have much in common with an actual uh, you know, meat-eating uh, experience. 
Now, when we look into the future, I believe, and, and, and from piece of meat, we believe that in around 2040, we will have these three-dimensional cultured meats, so the full stake at scale in the market, right, in 2040. So, so what's, the, what's, the trans what's the transition here? Um, first of all, we've seen companies like Impossible and Beyond Meat really venturing um, into the space with great um, solutions, plant-based solutions. They've, they've really revolutionized the industry, which is probably very visible also in their, in their share price and valuations, respectively. Uh, and, and how did they do it, right? They've really pushed the envelope far when it comes to scientific, um, 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 uh, let's say, mimicking of meat products. Um, so so, so if, if you turn the package around, right, you will see up to 22, even 23 ingredients uh, in those products. There are lots of flavor enhancers in there, uh, different kinds of oils and fats, uh, binding agents, colorants, taste agents, starches. Um, in the case of Impossible, even genetically modified um, um, yeast in order to express uh, the hemoglobin. So, so I think the plant-based meat industry has really push the envelope as far as possible in order to get to the top right of the quadrant where meat like taste eats like look. However, as we see, there is still a large gap. And in effect, um, when, when we ask uh, plant-based customers, why do you like to eat and why did you try in the first place um, plant-based foods? The answer is curiosity, right? Um, so I like to try new foods and I've been hearing a lot about them. Oh, uh, and was curious is the answer that is driving customers, in this case, meat eating customers, to the plant based um, products. Now, when we ask them, why don't you eat plant based foods anymore? And why have you not changed your diet permanently? We hear the answer that only 28% uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the customers actually think that the taste is good or very good of these plant based products. Um, we also, we also see that there's a graph here on the bottom right, um, that the top reason for not wanting to eat plant, plant foods again is that they don't taste good. So, so, some, so there needs to be, something needs to be done, right? So on the one hand, we have impossible foods and Beyond Meat already pushing the envelope so far and driving a lot of people out of curiosity into the shelves buying those products. On the other hand, the taste is just not good enough yet, right? So, so what's missing? Um, oh. Yeah, so, so what is missing, um, and, 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 and you know, everybody who knows a thing or two about food science uh, will, will probably agree, is fat, right? So animal fat is what's driving taste and texture in products, uh, in, in meat-like products. It's driving meatiness, it's driving the mouthfeel, it's driving the Maya effect, it's containing lipids in cells that are being released once you chew on that, and then they're released into the mouth, you're... Uh, your saliva is reacting, your, your brain, uh, you know, is, is now connecting the experience to uh, meaty indulgence. Obviously, plant-based products today can't use um, this ingredient, animal fat, because they're plant-based. Uh, so they need to get very creative and come up with those 22, 23 ingredients. So now it probably becomes pretty obvious that uh, what we believe is, um, um, the, the, you know, the, the transition of how to get from as good as possible plant-based foods to almost meat-like plant-based foods uh, lies in um, the missing ingredient, uh, and, and which, which is, which is um, cultured fat. So in our case, it's also a non-GMO product. I think that's, that's actually something that uh, all three companies have been in common here uh, on, the, on, the, on the phone. So we all believe in uh, non-genetically modified cell lines and products. Uh, which, which, which I think is a, is a very strong statement, especially when looking at uh, regulation within Europe. Um, so by mixing these 15% of non-GMO um, cultured fat into a vegan hybrid nugget, uh, we can get almost to complete meat-like taste and even the meat-like look uh, is being improved. Um, so that's a bit um, what we are um, producing and what we're after. Uh, we've also shown um, Europe's first um, official cultured meat tasting uh, earlier this year, or I should say cultured fat tasting in this case, uh, where we have produced um, some chicken nuggets together with a cook uh, in Berlin. It was in, in March earlier this year. Uh, I had uh, 150 visitors attending. Um, it was very well received. Um, you also see the final product here on the left. Actually, it's a product that uh, it's, it's a picture that um, EIT food produced, so I'm also very happy to be 
together with Helen and, and Mark um, on the representing side of, of, of ERT Food. I think that's actually the first time the three of our companies also come together in that sense, so, so it's excellent. Um, we have shown this, um, this product. We've also had afterwards, um, on another day, a tasting uh, where we have um, fed in a, in a blind tasting the um, product that we've produced, so the hybrid versus the, um, a, a purely plant-based um, nugget versus a meat-based nugget. And we've seen on flavor, on juiciness, on tenderness and texture, overwhelming results um, when it came to the, to the responses of, of, that, of that taste panel. Um, so not only was the flavor perceived better, the juiciness perceived better, and the tenderness and texture perceived better, but also we were able to reduce the ingredients by 60%, right? Our hybrid nugget contained seven ingredients, the vegan nugget, 18 ingredients. Um, so that's, uh, I think, uh, on the one hand, an improvement in um, experience, so basically taste experience, and on the other hand, a reduction of um, ingredients, which, which we hope to be offering to the industry. Um, so how to get involved? Um, today we're working with food partners um, along a um, you know, five-step um, process where we are looking to co-develop together with food partners a um, plant-based food product containing cultured fat as an ingredient, right? And, and five steps, as I mentioned, in the first step, we're defining kind of the product foundations. Uh, do you want a sausage? Do you want a nugget? Do you want a burger? Uh, which technology are you working with? 3D printing, more in the future, obviously, or extrusion, uh, or is it more of a, of a, of a frozen goods, uh, a frozen foods processing? And then in the steps two to three to four, we're gathering technical feedback, both from the production line, but also from consumers um, and conduct um, you know, sensory analysis before preparing the market entry together with the food partners. Uh, we're currently engaging in such activities um, in Europe and in Singapore and are inviting um, potential interested partners to reach out and have an open discussion. Um, I was also asked, to talk a little bit about the Flemish grant, um, if I understand, stood Natalie correct? I don't know if we still have time. I didn't follow. Uh, yeah, yeah, you have the, the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's a, that would be a great addition. So now we talked a lot about cultured fat. What we are also producing uh, as piece of meat is a cultured liver, a a, um, a pâté de foie gras, uh, for this project that we're doing together with the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, with the Biobase Europe, uh, with the two companies, uh, Solina and Nauta, um, all based in Flanders. We have received a government grant of 3.6 million uh, euros. And over the time frame of uh, three to four years, uh, we're aiming to produce a uh, culture. It's, it's, pretty, it's, it's pretty similar to the cultured fat, just that it's liver, right? So uh, a cultured liver product, duck liver product that we will mix in a plant-based matrix and then mark it as a, um, as a, as a cultured pâté de foie gras um, project. We are extremely grateful to have been selected as part of this consortium. I believe it's uh, probably one of the largest public grants uh, that have been awarded towards cultured meat. And that's definitely a, a very rich pool of partners that, that we're drawing um, from and that we're also looking to um, pay back to. So any questions, uh, probably we'll take them after the, the three presentations. I'm looking forward to answer those. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for this presentation, uh, David. Um, so now we're uh, going to have the Mark uh, presentation. Yeah, thank you, uh, Natalie. Um, oh, I start with the last slide. That's not smart. Um, second. All right, uh, good to see so many participants. Um, uh, good evening. Um, I'm going to talk about um, scientific progress, I guess, um, and most of the scientific progress that, at least that I am aware of, um, obviously um, a, a good example is what is happening in our lab and, and in our company. Um, it's kind of paralleled by what is done in other companies. Um, I'm not always 
completely aware of what's happening there because some are more secretive than others. Um, but this is just an example of how progress actually um, happens uh, and has happened since the first uh, presentation of a cultured meat hamburger in uh, 2013, which at that time appeared to be somewhat of a um, product launch, if you like, because we uh, it was cooked and it was eaten uh, and things like that. But it was actually a show of, you know, this is the technology, it can be done. Um, and from here, we need to uh, work to make it um, something that is more compatible with um, with a, a future kind of food system, both in terms of price, scalability, but also being animal free other than uh, the cells themselves. So in, in our minds, the cells will always be animal derived uh, one way or the other. Um, and there are many different variations in there, uh, but they will always be animal derived, but all the other components um, should not be. Uh, mostly because you cannot really uh, multiply them. So if you if you use those components and you cannot multiply them, you would still need a lot of animals to create the meat. So we want to get rid of all those other components that you basically cannot multiply. Uh, just to show this is um, a, a, um, uh, a, a moment in time of the company uh, of which I am a chief scientific officer. Uh, this was somewhere between 2018 and 2019. Uh, currently we are at uh, 45 to 50 people and we moved to 75. Um, in by the end of this year, which is really exciting because that means that a lot of people, and not only of course in this company, but also in the 40 to 50 other companies in the world, including Aleph and, um, uh, and Piece of Meat, um, the more people start working on this, the easier it is to get those problems solved and the faster they get solved. So it's really exciting that, that now a lot of people are actually working on this, whether three, four years ago, we were pretty much the only ones. Um, for those of you who are not completely familiar with the process, uh, uh, this is um, how we look at it. The, the process is divided in uh, three steps, if you like. One is um, taking the cells and letting them multiply as much as you can. Um, two is to um, coerce those cells to make tissues, um, either muscle tissue or fat tissue or both, or a um, complex tissue like Aleph is doing. Um, and three is if you make those in, in batches, muscle and fat, you have to combine them into a hamburger or a patty or whatever. So uh, the first step is really a very critical step. It is a multiplication of cells that you derive from an animal. And the, the better you are at it, the, the less amount of animals you need to create a certain amount of beef. So you want to scale this up to tremendous scales. And you've seen um, the, the picture on the right. Um, Helen has uh, shown a similar picture. Uh, these are all still um, non-existing uh, facilities, as far as I can tell. Um, uh, most of the companies are at the stage where they, in the next year or so, they will uh, build these facilities and they will start to uh, look at that type of scale. But currently, as far as I know, uh, none of the companies is really at that scale yet. But just to give you a framework of uh, uh, where we are. Now, in order to fill those large tanks, you need to, and you start with a very small number of cells. Uh, we take biopsies from a cow, which are only half a gram. So you can imagine there's not that many cells in there. And uh, you gradually have to step up from small kind of components to larger and larger components to get the uh, really amount of cells that you need to uh, create lots of uh, tissue. Um, for most of the cells that we're using, for most mammalian cells, that is true. You have to actually grow them on uh, microcarriers in those tanks and then you have to separate them. So there's quite some technology involved in scaling this up and that's one of the reasons why um, it still took some time to um, start scaling this. Um, in our case we uh, make 
uh, small muscle fibers. Uh, so that's the second step in the process. Once you have sufficient numbers of cells to, to make muscle fibers out of them. Um, and uh, we kind of separate that. So we make muscle fibers in one batch of the process and we make fat cells in another uh, batch of the process. Um, and we get better and better at this. These stem cells are designated muscle stem cells or somewhat designated fat uh, stem cells. So they know very well how to make these, um, these tissues. This is, um, I guess this is also what uh, a piece of meat is doing this. This is a, a sample of uh, our fat tissue. Um, and you see here in the right uh, lower corner, you see real fat cells um, that have developed into what we call white uh, fat cells, very thick fat cells with a fat profile that is uh, very similar to that of, in our case, bovine fat. Um, and the good news is that we um, are now reaching kind of 100% um, maturation of the cells into fat cells. So that's a relatively robust um, and um, well understood process. This is all in the absence of uh, animal components. Uh, the other good news is if you take the cells from a cow, um, and this is uh, here we have like 30 isolations from cows um, that, and, and this is a growth curve of these muscle cells. They, they all kind of, it's, it's very robust. It's very reproducible. It doesn't really matter that much um, from which cow you take them. They all uh, grow kind of in the same way. And we even have taken cells from different strains of cows with different speeds of muscle growth but in the lab, they grow pretty much in the same way. So it's a very predictable and reproducible system. Uh, one of the key aspects of this whole technology um, is how often those cells actually can multiply. And since we are using primary um, stem cells, and not like embryonic stem cells who can multiply for a much longer time or induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, we use primary stem cells and they have the advantage that they differentiate very easily into muscle cells. They have the disadvantage that after a, a certain number of doublings of proliferations, they stop. Um, so we are currently uh, around 32 doublings and that means that from half a gram of biopsy, you can make 2,000 kilos of meat. Um, that is already quite satisfying. Uh, you can take a couple of biopsies from the cow, um, so you can already reduce the number of cows tremendously. But of course, we are more ambitious than this. Um, and this is an exponential curve. This y-axis here is exponential. So if you get from 30 to 35, you all of a sudden get um, somewhere in the order of uh, 20,000 kilos out of that half a gram. So if you step up this a little bit, you get tremendous multiplication of uh, this material, which is good news because you need less cows or less biopsies from cows. Um, uh, here is just uh, you know a growth curve of these cells that grow on these microcarriers. This is just a nice picture where they grow on the microcarriers. And after you have grown them, they still differentiate into muscle fibers. These are primitive muscle fibers, but for us, it's a showcase that they can uh, actually uh, differentiate. Um, we have tested a lot of these microcarriers. Uh, so there, there's a lot of variables that you basically have to optimize to get to your preferred process. An important part of the development that's actually 20% uh, of our company, roughly, um, is to make the components animal free. And one, uh, and there was also, there was already in the Q&A a question about this, uh, can you culture these cells in the absence of serum? Traditionally, if you culture cells, you culture them in the presence of serum, that means that you, require a blood product from animals to, uh, to grow the cells. And of course, all the companies are doing kind of the same thing. They're trying to get rid of that serum because nobody wants to use serum. Nobody in the end can use serum. So everybody wants to get rid of it. Um, and you have to develop these so-called serum-free media. 
Uh, and again, about 20% of our effort um, is going into that. Uh, and we have now developed four um, serum-free media, both for proliferation and maturation of muscle cells and proliferation and maturation of fat cells. If you think about how this is going to work in, in the future, I will go a little bit wrap up through this because uh, this is not so much science as how do we see this uh, scaled up in these large bioreactors. Um, and you end up with our kind of assumptions and some of them are validated by, by experiments that a, a thousand liter bioreactor creates somewhere between 20 and uh, 10 or 20 um, uh, tons of meat per year. That's kind of a reasonable, as there's still some range in it, but it's kind of a reasonable estimate. If you go through that and you assume that you're going to take part of the world production of meat, then um, let's say if you take 10% of the world consumption of meat, which is about 30 million tons per year, um, you end up with uh, 2 million uh, bioreactors of that uh, thousand liter. So that's, that's a tremendous amount. If you want to replace the total world consumption of meat, um, it's, um, it's 20 million of those bioreactors. And that's currently already one and a half times more than the total fermentation capacity. So the total bioreactor capacity that we have. It's not undoable, but it's a tremendous um, task. Uh, and that's uh, ahead of us. A lot of people have uh, commented on the cost of this production. And um, we mentioned when we, when we launched this hamburger in 2013, that it was a quarter million euro to make. And everybody kind of laughed at it, which actually was our intention because we didn't want to give the impression that it was already a product that you could sell around the corner. Um, and in order to get the price down to reasonable prices, a lot of things have to come together. It's the culture system, it's the cell density, it's the number of doublings that you get out of the cells, but also the um, still expensive components that we need to grow the cells, because this is in essence a medical technology. All the components are pharma grade, and we're gradually moving from pharma, pharma grade to, uh, oops, to uh, food grade um, uh, materials as an input in these, these cells. In addition, uh, we are starting to work on recycling, um, and all those factors together uh, will eventually drive the cost of this meat to a cost that is similar to current meat or, or even lower than that. So currently we are at about 150 euro per kilo or so, which is still a lot, but it's already way down from that um, quarter million for one hamburger. And for the recycling, this is a very technical slide. On the left, you see essential amino acids. Those are all the essential, so those are all the amino acids which are building blocks of proteins that you and I cannot make and a cow cannot make them either. Um, on the right, you see the non-essential amino acids that you can basically build from glucose and fatty acids and stuff. So here you see after seven days of culture that a lot of those amino acids are still in there. And those are the expensive components of the feed. And typically after seven days or even after three days, we throw the, the culture medium away. Um, so we are, in that sense, uh, overly wasteful. Um, and if we can reuse that medium, that would mean a tremendous um, increase in efficiency and decrease in uh, cost. So we are, uh, again, somewhat like 15% of our company is actually working on this recycling. Um, I was asked to talk about regulation. Um, the, uh, there, and there were already a couple of questions. Why is it so hard in Europe to get this regulated? Um, that's kind of the impression that it's hard to, in Europe to get it regulated. Um, in fact, uh, the reason why we have that impression is because it's very well described in Europe. In a lot of other countries, it's not well described, uh, meaning that they still have to start describing this and then start the regulation. Um, in Europe, it's a novel food. Um, 
and there's no way around it. And I think it makes a lot of sense that it's a novel food because it's a new production system. You have to show that this is an absolute safe product uh, before you uh, give it to consumers. I'm, I'm fully in agreement with that. And you just have to go through those hoops uh, and show that it is completely safe. I think as consumers, we all should want that. Uh, and also as producers, of course. Um, it's a it's a tough process and it has to be a tough process um, uh, right now it takes about a year and a half as far as I know there is no there have been no applications yet um, for novel food no filings in in Europe um, and neither have there been any filings at least not in cultured meat there have been in cultured fish um, in the US in the US the situation is a little bit more complex because you have two institutions EFSA or sorry um, FDA and USDA they have come to an agreement um, uh, somewhere already a year and a half ago and they recently um, uh, they recently came out with a, a document that states what type of um, things you have to comply with uh, to file a, um, a food application in cultured meat so that is a document that already existed in Europe for about five years and now FDA and USDA finally uh, assembled a similar document. Once they have done that, it, actually the real process of approval can go faster in the US than in, in Europe um, and it can go even faster in Singapore and, and maybe in Japan and maybe in South Korea. Those are kind of the five areas where people are actively thinking about um, uh, regulating. but. Uh, so far, uh, those um, applications have not been filed yet, with the exception of cultured fish. And the reason for that is that in the US, cultured fish is not a USDA um, issue, it's an FDA issue. So uh, they could move a little bit faster um, in that trajectory. Um, if you want to, this is a very, very broad overview in view of the time. We recently, together with uh, people from other companies like uh, Memphis and also Aleph, um, we uh, published a, uh, an overview, a review paper where a lot of the technological challenges are being covered. But what really is covered to a great extent is the regulatory issue. So if you want to review those and want to get what the state of the art is in the regulatory issues, uh, look at this paper because uh, Karen and uh, Nicole from Harvard Law School did a wonderful job in um, describing the, the, different, the differences between, for instance, the FDA, USDA on one side and Europe on the other side in terms of uh, uh, regulatory approval um, issues. So with that, I would like to conclude, and um, um, I hope we can get to the questions and answers for you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. So we have uh, actually many questions. I uh, don't think we have the time to uh, answer all of these questions. Uh, maybe we uh, can start. Uh, we had some uh, for David. Uh, so we had questions like, what cell do you use? Uh, for well, do you use like uh, do you grow uh, the uh, hepatocytes uh, uh, for cultured liver on micro carriers? Uh, what type of uh, fat cell do you produce? So this uh, type of uh, question from David. Thanks. So there were two questions, right? First one: uh, How do we grow the liver cells, and what kind of fat cells do we use? So those are two questions, two products. Uh, and indeed, the assumption on the liver cells was correct. We do grow them on uh, microcarriers together with the University of the Catholic University of Leuven, which has uh, you know decades of experience in cultivating um, hepatocytes uh, for in, uh, human hepatocytes on microcarriers. So we're using a proprietary technology of uh, the University of uh, Leuven for the uh, proliferation of um, the hepatocytes. So that's the liver product. And then as for the fat product, we're currently working with avian fats. Um, so both uh, chicken and duck, looking to expand that also into mammalian species uh, in later in Q3 this year. Um, here we're using cells that are growing in suspension. So we're not actually using any microcarriers or any um, bioreactors that rely on adhesive growth. Um, but at the same time, also not um, manipulating those cells in any way or form. 
Mm -hmm. We had also some question about the, the sales, like uh, how to get the sales. Like, uh, do you uh, do every company working on a uh, culture meat uh, uh, take sales using a biopsy? Um, or uh, if so, can you tell uh, when it can be replaced with a uh, it's a more more cruelty free, but I think it it, it was a less uh, cruelty free method. And what yeah. is the advantage of uh, culturing cells uh, from a biopsy versus utilizing your cells from embryonic uh, tissue and yeah. uh, differentiating them uh, in, in culture? Okay, so so there, there is a slight uh, advantage, I think, that also uh, Mark mentioned in his, uh, in his speech uh, when working with avian species uh, or when not working with mammalian. So we can extract embryonic and pre-embryonic stem cells in this case directly uh, from a fertilized egg even before an embryo has formed um, we we well in theory need uh, one of those cells they have unlimited proliferative capacity meaning they are continuous right um, they have uh, an unlimited doubling time uh, sorry doubling uh, unlimited doublings uh, so we do not need to go back uh, to the egg or to the animal in order to proliferate those um, for mammalian species, though, uh, granted, um, there are differences. Mm -hmm. And so, maybe, uh, Ellen and uh, Mark, uh, what, what about uh, so the, um, the way to get the sales for uh, beef? Yeah, exactly. I, I also wanted to invite Mark maybe to, to comment on it because yep. I, so I'm reacting visually. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm fine unless uh, Helene wants to uh, take it up. Um, uh, no, I think you. you uh, I'm not the scientific here, so I, I, I let you answer. <laughs> um, again, I, I don't want to advertise that paper, but there's actually a good section on this in uh, in that paper in Nature Food. Um, uh, so there, there are other possibilities, of course. You can use embryonic stem cells. Um, you can use induced pluripotent stem cells, and maybe in the end immortalized cells to, through a CRISPR-Cas type of um, uh, modification. So there are many, many um, uh, ways to do this. Um, unfortunately, some of the ways require genetic modification. And as we have pointed out in Europe, we would like to stay away from that, uh, not only from a regulatory perspective, but also a consumer acceptance uh, perspective. It's going to be a lot tougher. Uh, to get it accepted if it's GMO, whatever you may think of that. Um, the, uh, but there are also non-GMO ways of getting to these cells. And, and as I mentioned um, in, in my talk, we are at 35 doublings. In theory, uh, we should be able to get to 50 doublings. And then if you look at that graph, you get an insane amount of meat out of one biopsy. So. Uh, we are working on getting more and more doublings and better quality out of uh, those primary cells. And we believe that in the end, we will not need um, a um, embryonic stem cell or an induced pluripotent stem cell. They proliferate better, those or longer, those embryonic stem cells and um, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. But it's more difficult to get them to differentiate into muscle. Uh, differentiation into fat is is easier in, in a way um, and so I'm sure you can differentiate them into fat tissue it is harder to differentiate them into muscle tissue so um, you yes you win on the proliferation side you lose on the differentiation side but I think both both or all of those avenues are still being pursued so we're keeping our eyes and our minds open to look at other options um, and, and I think a, a fair amount of them are viable. Um, all of us want to reduce the number of biopsies from cows. There's no question because it's just, uh, you know, we just want to get rid of that if we can. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We had also a question about uh, that, uh, the, the, like what biomarker, my, biomarkers are you looking at uh, just to, to make sure that uh, the cells are healthy and to control uh, that in the bioreactor to control that they multiply but stay uh, healthy. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question, and it's something that, of course, the regulators will ask us as well. Um, and um, you have to kind of think about what are the risks of um, in in a culture system like this. This is not a novel issue. It ha has been an issue in medical applications of large scale cell culture. Uh, for a long time because 
you know, if cells become for some reason genetically unstable, um, it's, it's even more problematic for medical purposes than for a food purpose. Still, you want to um, establish this. And what you basically do, the, the, the practice that has been uh, used for this is you take a sample of your cells, of your batch, uh, you check for genetic stability, which nowadays is very cheap and very easy. Uh, you just do sequencing. Um, and then uh, you establish that they're genetically stable. And if that batch is genetically stable, you assume that the whole tank um, is composed of cells that are genetically stable. That's the process that is being used in, um, in uh, medical applications. And that's the process we're going to use in um, food applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We had also a question about like the, the presentation from uh, Ellen and the uh, relation with the farmers. Um, we had like, what does it uh, uh, actually mean, local approach for culture meat? Does uh, it mean that uh, small farmers will have uh, the animals only to serve uh, for the biopsies? Uh, and how uh, will these samples be efficiently transferred to the biofarms? So I think maybe also like the, how you envision the relation with the, the farmers. Mm. So first of all, what does it mean, local approach? It means that the meat will be produced when and where it's needed, locally, uh, in order to spare the transportation and to um, ensure uh, food safety. Um, the collaboration with the farmers, we are working on it. Uh, the idea is not that it would be only, uh, that they would only provide the, the sales. The idea is really to promote new jobs, uh, new opportunities for the farmers, uh, and we are working with on this. Um, uh, we are making, we are doing market studies to 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 understand what are the needs and how we can develop this collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we have set up a, co a couple of those collaborations, and of course, um, you know, um, farmers come in different flavors. Um, some want to start producing this themselves. Um, some want to just be kind of a farm for donor animals and and you go there as a company and you take biopsies and you and you go back um, but there are also uh, farmers who want to take this a step further and want to start producing themselves um, and and there are even ones who say well you know once I'm doing this I might as well start a restaurant um, as well so <laughs> It, it comes, all those kind of collaborations come in different flavors. Um, in addition to, um, and that has not been mentioned yet, is, you know, we need actually local crop farming that is suitable to produce the feedstock to feed the cells. Um, and so farmers can also be involved that way. Um, so there, there are many ways of involvement. Yeah, there are many ways and it's a new industry emerging, so there will be opportunities and uh, we are uh, establishing the, the, the basis of this, uh, this collaboration. Because we, we, what, what I mentioned in the last slide is that uh, we are a startup developing a technology, um, but farmers feed the world, not the startup. So we are developing this technology and we, and we want to share um, and to collaborate with the uh, agriculture, the current agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe do, that, David, do you have something to add? Or um, this topic? I, it's a bit, it's a bit difficult. So I think um, politically, all the right things have been said. Um, uh, in theory, yes, we do want to uh, engage and include farmers as much as possible. Um, uh, retrofit uh, skills were needed. Make use of the land um, that that is available right now. But then obviously there are many questions remain, right? So, so will the skill, will, will it be actually able to upskill uh, those individuals? Um, does it make sense to actually produce in a decentralized way from a unit economics perspective? Uh, are the farms located in the right locations uh, when it comes to access to energy and other resources? So I, I believe that um, from a um, conceptual level, um, the, the goodwill is there. But there is a lot of details that, uh, that, that all the companies here involved, including the farmers and, 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 the, politic and the politicians, uh, need to solve out together. So it does sound uh, very straightforward right now, but fortunately, I believe uh, we'll have, still have a long way to go until, uh, until the entire food system is transformed fully. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, you know the, the way we look at it, we look at um, uh, farmers basically as uh, entrepreneurs like ourselves. So you figure out together how you um, how you can uh, be useful to each other and um, and how you still can carve out a business for yourself. Um, so w- once these opportunities become available, when it's clear what type of crops we want to grow in these regions locally to uh, use as feedstock for cells, we will um, farmers, I'm sure, will see the opportunity and they will start growing those crops. Um, and yeah. They want to be a donor farm um, that may happen a lot of uh, yeah, I, I agree on the on the crop side and on the donor side uh, I see a great potential on the actual growing so putting bioreactor installing bioreactors on existing farms there I'm maybe a bit more um, cautiously cautiously skeptical but but I think the two points that you mentioned Mark are, are, are excellent yeah and also, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit less pessimistic than you are uh, because I think you can make the technology pretty um, robust um, so that um, um, relatively untrained people can do this. Um, it's going to, and in terms of the uh, the investments, I mean, if you if you look at microbreweries or um, or um, equipment that is there, fermentation equipment that's there in vineyards. Um, it's actually uh, not that crazy of an idea. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to, um, well, to just uh, answer the last question, um, unfortunately. Uh, so we had two questions from uh, students who would like to know what they can do to be, uh, uh, to be involved in this in- industry. So one said, how can students become part of this industry? Any internship uh, opportunity, training opportunities offered? What specific topics uh, within uh, bioengineering uh, would you suggest a student focus if they are looking to become a research scientist for one of these uh, companies? Do you have some advice for the people who would like to be uh, involved? Right. Um, yeah, well, we have um, uh, six internship uh, positions every um, couple of months, um, every half year or so. Um, and uh, we have been pretty well. The, some of them are uh, cell biology, uh, biomaterial, um, tissue engineering. Um, some, as you know, Natalie, have been outside of that scope, more on consumer acceptance or, or even sensory analysis. So um, that there are um, there are opportunities. I imagine there are not too many. We get many more applications than we can actually. Um, position so uh, yeah and, and it is the, the the farther in advance you know that you want to do this um, mm-hmm. if, if you know you want to do this doesn't matter in which stage of your study you are start connecting to companies because we we get flooded with uh, internship requests and we can only uh, accommodate so many I completely agree and I think even these days so we also for example have two internship roles open uh, right now uh, you can find them on LinkedIn they are remote right so I think especially in these uh, you know COVID times there are a lot of remote opportunities uh, it really have a, have a global stance to it uh, reach out to those companies but also be in touch with for example ProVeg uh, and uh, people like Natalie who are also organizing um, uh, trade associations and interest groups now increasingly uh, that also Ale Farms is, is driving uh, for Europe. I think on a policy level, um, there's a lot of activity going on right now. Try to get connected uh, with some of the, you know, uh, leading figures of the industry and, and, and you will be passed along until, until you find a good place to play a role. I think both on policy, on business development, on science, uh, we will need so many uh, new, uh, talents from all directions in order to push this forward. There will no, be no uh, no limitations and hands needed. Yeah. And just a last word. So at Alephams, we have a Generation Z, Z, Z um, advisory board. So they are invited to check on the on the website and maybe to be part of uh, of, of this because we are we, we, we are very interested by knowing the the needs and the views of the young generation. Um, so they're invited to to write to me or to to check on the website okay 
Okay, so I think that we have to end uh, this webinar now. Uh, so sorry, like for the, all of the questions uh, we are not able to answer today. Uh, we had uh, many more questions uh, actually, uh, but yes, we have we have uh, to stop. So I would like to uh, thank uh, you for uh, your participation. We had very great uh, presentations and a lot of uh, very interesting um, information. Uh, and yeah, so I'm, I'm wishing you a good evening and again, uh, thank you for the, our guests, to our guests and our attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks very much. Thank you for moderating. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.